Welcome again, everybody, to our bi-weekly Learn and Grow webinar. I'm your host, Winky Lumba, a commercial real estate investor. And today our topic is how to invest passively to live actively with private lending. I just wanted to ask you guys, did you ever ask yourself if you're a full-time investor, an entrepreneur, or just working another job? Or where should you be investing? Or what is your investing style? We have a very special guest today, Alex Bashir. She's going to address all that. And uh, she's going to be talking about the private lending and passive investing that worked for her. And she's going to share all her experiences. A little bit about Alex. Alex Bischers is a private money lender, a short-term rental owner and manager. She's an LP investor in syndications and private lending fund manager. She's also a bigger pocket published author with private lending book hitting the shelves in this August of 2022. Congratulations, Alex. And uh, she is very passionate about uh, educating uh, the female regarding the investing. And she does a lot of workshops too. And I did attend a bunch of her work workshops as well. So welcome, Alex. But before we get started, I wanted to go through a small little disclaimer, if you don't mind. Sure. Okay, so small little disclaimer, this webinar is strictly for educational purposes and should not be considered as a legal accounting or investment advice. So if you have any legal questions or legal matters, please consult with your CPAs, your attorneys. And once again, this is educational uh, webinar only. And um, some housekeeping items, uh, please put your questions in the Q&A box because in the chat box is sent to get lost and we'll address all your questions live. And uh, if we miss something, please email me at, at winky at loombyinvest.com later, okay? So welcome again, Alex. Stage is all yours. So let Thank me do sharing session. So what I will do here is I will share my screen. So you guys will have something pretty to look at and we can talk a little bit about private lending. Um, so, the question I get most often is what is private lending? So we're going to dive into that a little bit um, because there is a difference and I will explain the difference. And I think once you hear the difference, it'll, it'll clear up a lot of questions that you might have about what is private lending, what is hard money lending. In addition, this presentation, although it says, you know, how to get started being a private money lender, if you are an active investor, this is still going to be relevant information for you. If anything, this is kind of like a peek behind the curtain for what are private lenders thinking about? What are they looking for? What are they being taught to look for? And then you can start to align your business model or the way you're presenting yourself to what private lenders are looking for. So it works either way. I just wanna let people know that from the very get go. All right, let's move my little Zoom bar here. So, all right. So like I mentioned, Private lending is currently something that's in a little bit of a flux, uh, to be totally honest with you. Hard money lending is trying to move into our space, into our vernacular, because they're trying to escape that kind of negative connotation of what hard money lending is. Uh, for anybody that isn't familiar with the term hard money lending, that is generally something that is very, it's a loan that's backed by assets. So in this case, real estate, and it's not going to be so heavily underwritten by the borrower because they're assuming that the asset, should something go wrong, the asset's actually going to pay for, you know, any legal fees, owed interest, and the principal back to the person that's doing the lending. So when I say private lender, this is what I'm going to be kind of referring to, just so we can keep the information and the vocabulary the same. So my eyes, a private lender is going to be an individual or an entity that has capital to deploy, in either a mortgage or deed of trust, depends on which state the person is lending in, 
and it's going to be for non-owner occupied property. You'll, we'll talk a little bit about why that's important in the future. Uh, the lender usually can, you know, set terms, rates, any of the conditions for lending, you know, prepaid interest, um, defer interest, anything like that within the laws are what's called usury laws. So what, those are also going to vary by state. So what we're going to talk about you know, where to find private lenders a little bit later in the presentation. And I'll, I'll kind of reiterate why states are so important. And then the last thing I'm going to mention is <laughs> private lenders are not going to go publicly out on social media. They prefer to have something that's a smaller network of investors. I, for example, have, you know, three or four investors that I work with here in the Hampton Roads area. I'm in Virginia and just kind of constantly keep flowing cash from one deal to the next deal to the next deal. Uh, generally, I don't have to go looking for anybody uh, to lend money to that I would want to lend money to. But if you see, it happens on social media all the time, every single day, you'll see someone post, I'm looking for a private lender for my flip. And then you'll have a whole bunch of people say, I, I've DM'd you, I've sent you a message, blah, 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 blah. Chances are those are hard money lenders. And like I mentioned before, Private lending as a term is sort of getting invaded with the hard money lenders and they're calling themselves direct private lenders, direct correspondent lenders, um, and their business model is a little bit different. We're gonna talk about that. So just to be clear, again, just to kind of get some straight vocabulary out, there's going to be kind of two different things that private lenders are gonna look at. Um, one of them is going to be lean position. Some lenders are only going to lend in the first lien position, which means they have the first mortgage, the first deed of trust, whatever that is in your state. Um, usually when the property is purchased, so if you have an active investor that is looking to purchase, you know, a 3-2 ranch, they need $200,000 to do that. Um, they're going to come to a private lender and most likely be in the first lien position the private lender will be. There are some private lenders that do second lien position. It can sometimes be referred to as gap funding. And that would be if they are coming in behind a hard money lender, maybe the borrower has a private money loan elsewhere and they need some additional funds for, you know, overages for renovations. Everybody knows how expensive some of the material costs have gotten since COVID has become a thing. Um, second liens tend to be a lot more scarce. And obviously they're going to be a higher interest rate because there is that first lien position. And if you know if the first default, there's a potential that the second lien can be wiped out. Um, if you're interested in doing second lien lending, that's kind of its own animal, but I just wanna let people know that second liens are possible. But again, there's just certain precautions that need to be taken if you're interested in doing second liens. Now, some common loan terms, again, most active investors, it really it kind of cracks me up now. Most active investors, when they go to approach a private lender, the very first question I always get is, what are your rates? And I'm like, Meh, it doesn't work like that. Um, it's not, we don't have a term sheet for the most part. You know, we are not like, oh yeah, it's, you know, it's going to be 10 and two all day long. You know, that's just, that's not how private lenders work. Um, they generally have an idea of what they want to get. And then if, for example, I tell uh, investors that the first loan you do with me is going to be the most expensive because we don't have any history of working together. You might have a lot of experience elsewhere, but I have never loaned you money. So the first one's going to be the most expensive. I'm going to do the most underwriting. But then after that, it gets easy. As long as you hold up your part of the bargain and I hold up my part of the bargain, we'll keep working together. Not a big deal. So something I like to tell active investors is the rate Honestly, when you look at it on an annualized you know, basis, um, very, very minimal difference between doing something that's 10 point or 10% versus 11%, for example. Whereas some of these other factors, these other loan terms can be 100% more beneficial to you versus trying to sit and haggle over whether you're going to pay a 10% annualized rate or 11% annualized rate. For example, um, I'm one of the private lenders that does do second liens. So I give my borrowers the options. Um, they can have the loan for four or six months. Um, they can either pay all the interest at the end, but they're gonna pay 12%, or they can do monthly payments and they're gonna pay 10%. I have yet to have a borrower that has turned down not making monthly payments. They're happy to pay that little bit extra 
to not have to deal with a monthly payment for four to six months. And most of, I only fund fix and flips. So most of the time that interest is going to be paid by their retail buyer anyway. So they are totally happy about that. So that's just one example of how these different loan terms, other than the annualized interest rate, can actually be more beneficial. How you can have a negotiation with a private lender to a certain degree and say, hey, you know, can we do this? This is why I'm asking for that. Um, and go back and forth and have a discussion. Private lending is going to be uh, more of a relationship model. It's not going to be transactional. Like I said, you know, somebody's going to send me a message and go, what are your rates? I'm like, ah, it doesn't work like that. Um, so it's going to be something where we're going to be building trust. We're going to have mutual respect for each other. We're going to stay in communication with each other. So if none of that sounds fun to you, don't go looking for a private lender. Hard money lenders are your space, your style. They don't care what you do as long as you make the monthly uh, interest only payment. Now, I don't want to make it sound like I'm, you know, bad mouthing hard money lending. It does have a place in the marketplace, just like a hammer has a place in your toolbox. Am I going to go change out the light switch with a hammer? No, I'm going to use, you know, pliers and screwdriver. It's just another tool to have in your tool belt. There are advantages to hard money lending, um, or if you're getting a hard money loan, I should say, you know, obviously they're going to be very liquid. So a private lender, since they're lending out their own capital, if you don't happen to catch them when they have capital available, it doesn't matter how great your deal is or how great you are as a person or how much experience you have as an investor. If we don't have the capital lend, we can't lend it out. Whereas hard money being backed by institutional capital, warehouse lines of credit, maybe they have a fund, they are going to be a lot more liquid and chances are they're going to have capital available all the time. So I like to point that out. Uh, like I mentioned, some of these different terms you might be familiar with as, uh, for example, doing a personal guarantee. Some private lenders don't require a personal guarantee. Others, you're going to sign on the dotted line for any assets you personally own with that personal guarantee. Again, one of those things that could potentially be totally negotiable. It's really just between you and the lender as to what you're both looking for. Now, I've kind of broken down the loan process a little bit. Um, I know that you, some of you are probably pretty experienced real estate investors. And so some of this might be a little bit just kind of getting some baseline information. But I have discovered in the past talking with people, if you have bought your own home, for example, you know, especially if it was listed on MLS, you know, there's realtors involved, there's title companies involved, there's attorneys involved. There tends to be a lot of handholding when you do something with a conventional loan. And then when you kind of switch to you want to do some private lending, a lot of that handholding disappears. So you don't really know what you need to do when, which is why I run through this. So let's just kind of give you a quick overview of kind of the, what I would consider the loan cycle. The first thing, most important thing, I call it the contact phase, is you're just basically going out there and networking. You know, honestly, I met my first borrower in a Zoom room. Um, just happened to be we're both in the same market. We were both looking at the same types of property. And I was like, oh, let's work together. So you're just going to basically go out there and start networking. Um, if you find private lenders, you want to ask them, you know, what sort of property are you willing to lend on? You know, because just walking up to someone and saying, hey, you're going to fund my, re my next real estate acquisition. You know, that could be an elephant farm in Texas. That could be, you know, a duplex in New Jersey. That could be farmland in Nebraska. So being very ambiguous about it not going to get you anywhere. So that's why I say, ask, what are they willing to lend on? Or if you are a lender, you can also ask yourself, what are you willing to lend on? What would you be okay owning if you had to foreclose on this, nobody bids on the property, and you end up taking it back? That's really the question there. So what are you willing to own? The other thing I like to point out is putting together what I call a real estate resume. And this is good for both a private lender and the active investor. So the, uh, the uh, um, real estate resume portion of it is basically, you can make it whatever you want. You can make it a Google Doc. You can make it a PDF. You can make it a PowerPoint. You could make it a video that you record onto YouTube. And then if somebody asks about your background, your experience, what projects have you done, you can go, oh, here's all that information, Mr. Lender. Here's what you need. Um, or if you are, this also works for active investors, because if you are looking to JV, with some other people, with some other partners, this is going to be a lot of the information that they might want to know. 
You know, they're going to want to know how much experience you have. What are you bringing to the table? So having this, what I call a real estate resume together, it's really going to help just solidify that you have everything together, you know what you're looking for. And also just the act of putting this together, even if you don't show it to anybody, just putting it together is going to make you stop and think like, why is someone going to want to do business with me? What do I bring to the table? What am I hoping to get out of this interaction? And then really sit down and kind of collect all the data points, you know, for your various flips, you know, did I buy it for 164 or 168? You know, those types of things, all there laid out nice and pretty. Next one I call the lender phase. Um, this is where it's kind of at a very preliminary status. You know, you've, you've talked to somebody, maybe you ran into somebody in your network, maybe you ran into somebody at a RIA event or a conference, and you think, okay, good, you know, I, I think I might want to work with this person. So basically at that point, you're just going saying, here's whatever information they might be requesting. Um, a lot of times it's good if you're a lender to have some sort of checklist, maybe even just some sort of, you know, little video, just some way to convey information on what you're looking for, how you want to receive those documents. Uh, because I once had someone send me 75 pictures and 16 videos while I was on vacation with a very narrow bandwidth, like zero internet access. It's my phone spent the entire weekend trying to download these stupid photos and these stupid videos. And it wasn't even a property that I was going to lend on because it wasn't even in my market. They literally just photo bombed and video bombed me. They had somebody had told them I was a private lender and they just went nuts with this house they were going to buy in Idaho. I'm like, mm, thanks. <laughs> so don't do that. I'm telling you, don't do that. <laughs> But basically, at this point, you kind of want to consider it maybe pre-underwriting, you know, almost, it's not going to be necessarily as formal as filling out an application. Some private lenders do have an application, some don't, you know, it's not going to necessarily be as, as formal and as rigid as I think you're probably used to in other situations. And then we get to the fun part, anybody who's ever bought, bought property, you know, this is like the painstaking part, the, the underwriting phase. It's where you go and submit documents and then they dream up random questions to ask you and dream up the sometimes it seems fake document that they want you to provide for whatever the answer is to that question. Uh, but basically at this point, as both the lender and the borrower, we're just doing due diligence, you know, verifying how the property is going to be held. Like, is it gonna be in your LLC? Is it going to be in you and your wife's name? You know, is it going to be in you and your husband's name? You know, you and two partners. What does that look like? Obviously, assessing the value of that property, um, any sort of documentation we might need to kind of support that the, you know, the income of the property is accurate, your income as a borrower is accurate, that you have assets to back up, you know, hey, if the property needs $60,000 of rehab and you have $10,000 in the bank, this might be a problem, you know, so trying to basically stop problems before they exist. Um, basically, I kind of consider underwriting, like, I want you to present option, present me with information that's going to make me say, I have to do this loan. So if there's anything that's kind of a little weird, you know, a little like, okay, I'm not so sure about this, just be upfront, be transparent. This is what it is. This is what's happening. This is what I think, this is how I acquired the property, this is how I got a contract on the property, whatever it happens to be. If you as a borrower can be more upfront and say, you know, I'm buying this property from a wholesaler, I have a mentor that's gonna help me through this, I don't have a ton of experience in rehab, but my brother-in-law is a general contractor and he's gonna help me out, you know, whatever that looks like, you wanna present kind of a coherent like picture of you know what you're doing, there's a business plan, you've thought about the numbers, you've researched the numbers and everything makes sense. And then fun, fun, title and insurance. <laughs> I will tell you there's two things, two types of insurance that I make every single borrower get. It is not debatable. This is happening or you're not getting a loan. They are going to get lender's title insurance and they are going to get hazard insurance, the appropriate hazard insurance. So don't try and go in there with a landlord policy and then tell me that you're gonna do $60,000 worth of rehab because that's a builder's risk policy. So, you know, yeah, I understand the landlord policy is a lot cheaper, but it's not going to cover anything that you do. So if one of your subcontractors sets the place on fire three days before it's supposed to be listed on MLS and you only have a landlord policy and they do, you didn't disclose to the insurance company, 
Now the property is under renovation, much less significant renovation. They are not going to pay that claim out. So it's basically you've wasted money on a policy in general. So making sure you have insurance and then it's the correct hazard insurance, the correct type of policy. Now lenders title insurance, 100% required. I usually make owner's title insurance optional. Um, I leave that up to the borrower. It's usually just a couple hundred bucks extra if you do the policy at the same time you do the lender's title insurance. For me and my risk tolerance as an owner of real estate, um, I'm gonna get the owner's title insurance. It just makes sense. Um, there's some different ins and outs to kind of pay attention to for title insurance, but we could go down a rabbit hole for a couple hours about uh, title insurance. But just know that those are the two requirements. There's going to be hazard insurance and there's going to be lender's title insurance and the active borrower pays for that. So again, they are somewhat paying for your money to be protected in this asset. But you as the lender still need to make sure it's appropriate coverage and you're comfortable with the type of coverage and the level of coverage that they got. And then fun, 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 the, what I call the Instagram moment. Everybody shows up at the table and everybody's got their like little pen in hand, you know, talking about all the moments that led up to them doing the closing, this is the fun part. So you'll get a HUD one, usually 24 to 48 hours in advance of closing. Um, you'll make sure that again, you're, you're included as the lender on the, on the insurance, hazard insurance as a lost payee. You'll get to review the promissory note, uh, the deed of trust or mortgage, depending on which state you're in. And this is both for the active investor and the uh, borrower or the passive investor and the borrower. Um, so you may, you know, there's some other things you might want signed, um, especially if you're doing second liens, you want to make sure that the first is caught up, for example, that it's not behind. You want to verify that the first mortgage company knows the borrower is taking out a second mortgage because that could potentially throw the first mortgage into default. Um, and make sure that if you are supplying capital for renovations as a private lender, the borrower needs to realize if you get a loan from me and a lot of other private lenders I know, you are not leaving closing with my with my cash. It's just not happening. Like there is, if you get fifty thousand dollars supposed to go towards renovations and you leave closing with fifty thousand dollars, there's nothing legally that stops you from going out and having the best weekend of your life in Vegas with my $50,000 instead of putting that money into the property. Now, why do I care what you're doing with that money? Because I have lent you capital for the purchase price and the renovations based on the fact that the property will be worth more once those renovations occur. Chances are it's not gonna be anywhere close to what it's going to be worth at the time of purchase. So that means I have then extended more money than the property is worth, much less maintaining that equity buffer lenders are gonna wanna see. So just be aware, a lot of hard money lenders also do this. It's called a refund draw model. Uh, if you are a borrower, chances are you're potentially going to need some of that capital upfront, even if you're getting 100% for renovation costs, chances are you're not leaving closing with a check. You're going to need to have some sort of uh, documentation to support that you have put money into the property, uh, maybe a mechanics lien waiver to say, hey, look, general contractor signed off that he's been paid for X, Y, and Z work. We're good to go. So there is, a, there is going to be a requirement for capital if you are an active investor, um, at least with me, for renovations because you're going to be refunded after the work is done and paid for. Now, I dove into this a little bit, um, really for the rehab and the draw process, it's 100% negotiable usually, you know, what do they want to see, what timelines, um, some lenders will actually issue funds along a timeline, so you'll get your first disbursement two weeks into the project, the next one, you know, maybe a month into the project, whatever, as long as consistent progress is being made on the property, they're fine, you know, especially if it's somebody that you've worked with, maybe you've done three or four loans successfully with them, um, you're, you tend not to worry as much as where things are going. You know, like I said, that first deal you do with me though, that's gonna be the expensive one and that's gonna be the one we do a lot of underwriting because we don't know each other in that capacity. But after you've kind of garnered someone's trust, you've earned someone's trust, then fantastic. I'm gonna ask less questions because at that point to me, you are less of a risk because we have that successful history together. So like I said, this whole rehab process, the whole draw process, 
100% tends to be very flexible uh, negotiation between you and the private lender. And then the fun part, so we call this <laughs> the rental and sale phase, depending on what you're doing with the property. Are you holding it for long term, whether you're going to turn it into a short term rental, is it going to be a long term rental, or maybe you're getting it ready to sell either to a retail buyer, maybe another investor as a turnkey property to be a rental, whatever that looks like that tends to be the two exit strategies for a private loan is it's going to be sold, or it's going to be refinanced with conventional funds, you know, from their bank, maybe a DSCR loan, commercial loan, depending on what the borrower uh, looks like. I can tell you from this point, uh, nobody finishes a rehab on time. So whatever they tell you the rehab's going to be, I would say, especially with COVID, add like 25 to 50% of the time onto there, uh, just to kind of give you an, an idea. I had a borrower that literally ordered windows the day he closed. He showed me the receipt. It was all paid for. He ordered them. He spent four months waiting for windows. And it's not like he had weird size windows. You know, the house wasn't that old. It just needed updated vinyl windows. He ended up waiting four months just for windows. I have another investor that ended up having to give the seller credit at closing because he could not get appliances during mid-COVID and it was holding up the sale. So he just ended up giving a credit to the, to the new buyers and say, hey, or go buy whatever appliances you want. I can't get anything into the property. Um, so just kind of keep those things in mind that the scope of work um, is just a projection. And then the fun part for every lender is repayment. Obviously, the return of capital is paramount in the thought process versus the return on capital that's going to be secondary. But again, you're going to be paid because the property was sold and then the new retail buyer or maybe the new investor's loan is going to pay off that private loan. You're going to refinance it in a commercial product or a conventional financing or you can refinance into another private loan. Um, some investors, I know, actually know a couple active investors that this is actually their strategy. So they will come to, an, to another active investor or you know, maybe they have self-directed IRA retirement funds and they say, hey, um, I wanna take down this property. Would you mind lending this to me for 12 months? And that other active investor, sure, I got self-directed IRA money. I'll go ahead and fund this deal but I need it back in 12 months for something else. And then that gives 12 months to that first active investor to go and kind of recruit through his network, um, you know, meeting people and finding another person. They might not identify as a private lender, but another person to say, you know, they want mailbox money for the next five years. They're like, I don't care what you do. The property's stabilized, it's rented, I'm happy. Just send me my money every month you know, so I can make my car payment and make my own mortgage payment, you know, whatever that looks like. So it is possible to refinance into another private mortgage. And then the fun thing, this goes both ways. So finding private borrowers and finding private lenders. So these two things are not mutually exclusive. You know, it goes both ways. Like I mentioned, it's a relationship. So as I mentioned before, Posting publicly in groups and forums is going to be tend not to be successful. I'm sure all of you have seen it. Somebody comes forward saying they want private money for some project, and then it's just this barrage of messages and comments. You know, I'll DM you. Here's what we do: it's four percent interest only for five years. It's not secured against property. Total scam every time. Total scam. Don't do that. All right. Um, just start talking to people in your network. You might be surprised. Like I mentioned, some private lenders actually are also active investors. You know, they are doing fix and flips. Maybe they have some retirement money that they can't put into their own projects, but they're happy to lend out onto your project. So you never know who might have some extra capital lying around that they want to put to work. This is also true for friends and family. So if you talk with, you know, coworkers or your aunt who's retiring, you know, and wants some additional income because she's retiring, hello, introduce them to private lending. Um, you can actually get referrals from other lenders. So for example, if I don't have any capital available, but one of my borrowers has a deal that, you know, one of my past borrowers has a deal that I think is a great deal, I can make a warm introduction to potentially someone else in my network that'll say, hey, Bob, I've went to this guy before, no problem, does a great job, does a great rehab, super great communicator, you know, if you have funds available, 
I can recommend this active investor to you. So again, referrals from other lenders, that warm introduction is always wonderful. It doesn't matter what you're trying to do. And then, like I mentioned, being as specific with people as you can. And this tends to trip up people because they're like, oh, I don't want to like crank down my criteria so much that nobody will make, nobody will meet those criteria. It's not a problem. I can tell you it's not a problem, except if you are somewhere like where Ms. Vinky is in California, you're not going to buy anything, not even a parking spot for under $50,000. So if you're going and saying, I'm only going to fund loans for $50,000 and I'm only going to do it in the state of California and I want to be in first lien position, it's just that literally doesn't exist. But outside of those parameters, we'll call common sense parameters for your market, um, it, you're free to make that whatever you want. So for example, I only lend on property that's in my local market. It has to be within 10% of the square footage of the neighborhood it's in. It has to be within 10% of the median home price for that zip code. It has to be normal construction, normal layout for the age of the home, the neighborhood of the home. And it has to have the intention to be put on the market and sold. I don't want to be involved with investors trying to do refinances, especially right now with COVID as the cases go up, underwriting criteria goes up, cases come down, underwriting lets up a little, and we've just been doing this roller coaster for the last two years, versus on the retail side, we've had an epic housing shortage. So as soon as that property hits the market, you're going to have retail buyers wanting to buy that, and pretty much right now, conventional lenders they're not quite back to like pre-2008, but they're getting pretty close where if you have a pulse, they're giving you a mortgage. So to me right now, that's a safer exit strategy than trying to re have a uh, investor refinance into conventional or commercial product. So that's why I only fund fix and flips. So as you can see, I really drilled it down to this is what I do. This is where I do it. This is what I'm willing to lend on. And this is the maximum I'm willing to lend up to. For example, I'll do 70% of after repair value. So everything else, I don't care if it's brick. I don't care if it's got wood siding. I don't care if it's got vinyl siding. I don't care if it's concrete block. You know, you if that matters to you, you can totally say, I'm not going to lend on, on properties that are, you know, over 50 years old because you're worried about, you know, what happens when they start opening up the walls. They're going to find some interesting things. Um, and when you start opening up the walls in these old, old homes, both good and bad. So like I said, being very specific, whether you are the lender or when you're looking to borrow private funds, 100%, the more specific you can be, again, within those common sense metrics for your market, the better off it's going to be because it's going to direct the conversation to the people that are doing that type of investing or doing that type of lending for that type of property. And then here's my contact information. So I wanted to leave a little bit of time to do some questions. Um, that is my email address, my LinkedIn picture or my LinkedIn URL, uh, invest passively to live actively because I'm very, very adamant about my lifestyle fitting uh, the way I invest. So I choose to invest in real estate uh, doing private lending because I can pick up and take that anywhere I go. I'm a military spouse. So you never know where we're going next, how long we're going to be there, you know, all kinds of fun. Um, so I can't be necessarily an active investor in a local market because I might not only live there six months. I might only live there as long as I've lived anywhere. It's about two years. So before COVID, it was not as commonly accepted to kind of remote invest as it is now. Um, that yes, that's an option. I could do that, but I like the way I invest myself. Um, there's a, I run an educational group on Facebook, it's called Private Lending Lessons. You might have seen the little logo on the background here. Um, it's 100% an education and networking group. So it's not gonna be a place for people to go and post their loan products. We try to you know, do some vetting of people, it can't be 100%. And then as Binky mentioned, um, I have a book coming out with Bigger Pockets uh, about private lending, how to do private lending, a lot of action items, a lot of things to consider. And again, it's written from the perspective kind of right down the middle. So if you are someone that wants to use private money, you could hand this book to someone in your network and say, hey, read this, see what you think about it. I'm involved in real estate and I'm looking for a lender. Or you could be the person that wants to learn how to lend and that will be kind of the manual you would use to learn how to lend as well. And that is all I have. So I am ready for some questions. 
Wow, that was super awesome. Very informative, Alex. So I wanted to ask you a few questions before I go to the audience questions, you know. How did you do it yourself? How did you become private lender? If you can share your experience with us, because you know everybody wants to invest. I'm in the investing too. I'm active and passive both investor. But sometimes, like you said, you know, you just find yourself uh, another full time job, you know, versus being going into entrepreneurship. So, what yes. was your journey like? If you can share that with us. Absolutely. So I had done the rental thing, the long-term rental thing. I had done a fix and flip. I was miserable. I mean, miserable doing both of them um, because I, I call it real estate hazing. So what a lot of people don't realize is when someone says real estate investing, they only think of one of two things. It's either I'm going to be a fix and flip and I'm going to put pretty sinks into ugly houses like they do on TV or I'm going to be a landlord. And like, that's the only two things that matter, you know, and nobody's having a conversation like, wait a minute, there's a lot of other things out there. And do those two methods actually fit with what you're good at, with what your goals are and your lifestyle? Because, you know, a lot of people are out there working towards financial independence, financial freedom, whatever that looks like for you. It's not going to be generally found in one deal. You know, you're going to be doing this for probably years um, so you might as well find something that fits who you are as a person, fits your time commitment, fits your lifestyle, because you're going to be doing it like the, the journey is actually the important part. The goal is just why you started the journey. And a lot of people focus on that end. I want to be financially independent part. And they don't really think about like, does this style of investing actually suit me? Like the reason I invest in syndications as an LP investor and not a GP is because I don't want to do the monthly meetings, like make sure the KPIs are there and make sure the renovations are on track and are, should we paint the walls beige or gray? I don't care. Like, that's just not me. I've, I've learned that very early on in my life. Just don't make me decorate anything. I'm from New Orleans. I'm going to put make everything purple, green, and gold. Um, so <laughs> that is not one of my strengths. Like, no. Um, but the reason I invest as an LP and a private lender is because uh, the LP side it lets me invest on the equity side. So I have some of the upside potential with the equity multiple. I have some of the you know tax benefits for depreciation that you don't get as a private lender. So I'm not going to say private lending is the end-all be-all way of investing, but it suits who I am. You know, it suits my lifestyle. Wow, that's a good answer. So with private lending, what kind of risk is involved? Like, you know, I will be like, I won't be able to sleep if I wanted to say, okay, I wanted to lend today $100,000 to Alex, even mm -hmm. though she's my good friend. So I'll be like scared to death. Oh God, I lost my $100,000. Maybe I'm not sure if I'm going to get back or no. So you do get those kind of thoughts, you know, versus oh, yeah. putting money into syndication. It like more secure feeling because it's not like somebody's going to run away with your 50,000 or hundred thousand because million others coming in with your 100,000, right? So there's like some relief or some peace of mind, but just like giving somebody, you know, just like without any term shade, I'm not sure if a term shade is binding anyways to begin with, you know, since yeah, you yeah. earlier, we don't need that term shade for the private lending. And I'm not sure what the risk is. And uh, I know the word is there, but at the same time, you know, what is the surety that will get the money back? Or how do we make sure that it's, pretty legitimate thing that we are doing. Yes, and I will say risk is kind of a funny thing because it's it's really hard to compare apples to apples. Like syndication LP investing is 100% completely different than private lending. So for example, as an LP investor, you're actually buying shares of an LLC. Your money isn't backed by real estate at all. You're actually buying shares of, an, of a company, a new company at that. Um, so from that perspective, to me, I'm not saying that's more risky. It's just a different type of risk. So 100% the syndicators can decide to do with that capital, whatever they want. If they want to throw the biggest party in Vegas, technically there's nothing that stops them. You know, those pro forma numbers they show you on a pitch deck are projections. So whenever I get an LP investor, that's like, oh, you know, uh, this, I don't know which deal to invest in. It's this one or this one. And then they step out off the three same numbers. They spout off the cash on cash return, the IRR, and then usually the equity multiple. And I'm like, that tells me nothing. Like, I don't know how they underwrote the deal. 
I don't know how conservative it was. I don't know the market. I don't know how growth it is. Like there's a lot of numbers that go into those three numbers, but LP investors will focus on those three numbers thinking it's chiseled in stone. So, you know, again, that's, that's just, that's perceived risk from my standpoint, not saying it's a risky way to invest, but that's my perception of risk with syndication. Whereas when you're doing in uh, private lending, you actually have a recorded lien instrument on the property. So whether that's a first mortgage or a second mortgage, so we'll just make things easy. Somebody took out a $100,000 loan with you in their first mortgage, they get six months into the project and they're done. They, they can't do any more work. Their wife is ready to divorce them because they decide to be a weekend warrior and figure out how to do this whole rehab thing on, you know, their off time from their W-2 job. Um, and they're just done. They wash their hands of it. They, you know, walk away. At that point, um, the property or the note can go into default. You can go through the process of foreclosure. Um, foreclosure is very different in each state. So knowing what that looks like in your state, some states, it's two years. Other states, it's three months. You know, it's really just a matter of what that process looks like. Um, it goes up for auction, essentially. Uh, whoever bids on the property, you can usually set a minimum. So if you're, if you've won hundred thousand dollars, you know, you can put the minimum at like one hundred ten thousand dollars to cover your legal costs and whatever. And then it goes up for auction. Anybody who's ever bought a piece of property at auction, you realize there's usually some betting back and forth. Um, and highest bidder wins. Um, and then since you have the first lien, any of the proceeds from that sale go to satisfy the first lien. And if there's any other liens on the property, then those go to satisfy those other liens. And if there's not, the rest of the funds will actually go back to the borrower because it's money they're entitled to above and beyond your lien. Um, so in that case, my $100,000 is buying, you know, interest and access to a property. So if the borrower walks away from the deal, can't perform, whatever that is, I have some sort of legal recourse. It might take a little bit, but I have some legal recourse to be able to get my hands on that hard asset. So if nobody bids on the property, I can take it back as the first lien holder and do what I want with it, which is why I said earlier in the presentation, when you're thinking about what you want to lend on, just think about, would you be comfortable owning this? So worst case scenario, the worst of the worst, you end up owning this for whatever the lien is, if you're in the first lien, for whatever that principal balance is, are, would you be happy with that? Hmm. So if you're on the second lien, the first lien is going to be paid off first. Like if the bank is the first lien, they're going to get paid before you. Then you're going to get paid if you're just coming in and mitigating the gap between the loan and the borrower. That's yep. what your presentation was earlier. Yeah, um, yeah. If, you, if somebody's doing second lien lending, um, that is definitely a risk to second lien lending, which is why it's got the higher interest rate. You know, there's not that many private lenders that do second lien. And also you do run that risk of, you know, if the first lien goes into default for some reason, you know, that default interest rate kicks in, the legal fees, the late payments, all of that eats away at any equity buffer that happens to be in the property uh, to begin with. Interesting. So when did you, how long you've been doing it? I was going to say, when did you start this? I've been actually doing it um, on and off for years. It was just kind of a funny thing. So at a RIA meeting, I mean, literally 20 years ago, I got approached by someone, you know, that I, they were just, I'm in the South, I'm Southern. I've never met a stranger. We just started talking to each other. And he actually was a private money uh, lender and a hard money lender, hard money broker. And we were just talking. He's like, oh, what are you in college for? And I told him, you know, I'm doing science classes. He's like, oh, so you have to be pretty good at math. And I was like, yeah, you know, I'm in Calc 3. I'm doing okay. You know, my, I have graduated to where math is no longer numbers. It's all letters and weird symbols. And uh, he's like, have you ever thought about doing, you know, being a loan officer? And I'm like, no, never been on my radar. Like I'm in college and I'm a chemistry major. This was not on my radar. Um, and he kind of explained a little bit about it. And then he said, you know, the words every college student wants to hear. It's like, you can work your own hours. And I was like, sold, I will do this. <laughs> so, <laughs> so back then, this was back before like phones were smart. You know, you were faxing things to people with kind of the cutting edge technology. Um, and so I was driving applications out to borrowers at properties. I was walking properties to see, you know, what needed to be done. What was the scope of work? You know, I was driving by comparables. You know, this is back before, you know, the digital, you could pull up an online appraisal in 30 seconds. That wasn't a thing back then. So it actually gave me an opportunity to really see, you know, active investing kind of behind the scenes, you know, because 
I was learning as I go. Like I didn't know that much about real estate when I took on this gig, but I definitely learned a whole lot since then. But one of the things I learned, I like to listen a lot. And I think people underestimate the power of listening. Um, I was going to the landlord meetings and I was going to the fix and flip meetings, you know, again, being an outgoing person that was part of my job is networking with potential borrowers. And I kept hearing the same things. And so, for example, at the landlord meetings, I would hear people, and this was in Florida, Florida is generally not a cash flowing market, it's more of appreciation play. Um, the, you know, the landlords would kind of cross their fingers that somebody's going to pay the rent on the first. And then they're keeping their fingers and toes crossed that nothing breaks in those 30 days. And then at the end of the 30 days, they can maybe leave with $150 that month, you know, in, in net profit. Um, but, you know, they're okay because they're getting appreciation and they have depreciation write off and whatever they want to tell themselves to sleep at night. Like I'm a cash flow investor. Nobody can eat equity and I can't eat depreciation. So I'm worried about $150 a month. And then on the other side, I had fix and flip investors. They were coming into the to the office at the time when people actually had to write, you know, check. They were coming into the office to drop off their, you know, their mortgage payment, their interest only payment. And again, making conversation. How's it going? What's going on with the project? You know, and story after story, you know, contractor ran off with the deposit, and, you know, and half the materials. I've on my third contractor because they can't, they keep screwing up the job. It was, you know, the tenant moved in and hasn't paid since. And I'm like, Okay, so you're making no money and you're very unhappy. You're potentially making $150 a month and you're not real thrilled with life. Meanwhile, my boss is on the golf course and I'm depositing checks between $700 and $2,700 a month you know, per borrower. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, hmm, I think I'm going to do that. I'm, I don't even like golf, but I'll do that. <laughs> and so, you know, again, my spouse is an active duty service member. So he we move a lot. I'm currently sitting my 19th address in 21 years. And you just bump into other people in the military doing real estate. And you're like, oh, well, I don't want to be a landlord and I don't want to do a fix and flip. But and so therefore, I don't want to JV with people because um, no. And so I was like, OK, you know, we'll help fund the deal, whatever that is, whether we come in the second lien position, whether we're the first lien, depending on where we're living. Um, we'll do that. And it was never anything that was kind of like formalized. It was just literally, I just kind of bump into other people I got along with. We were both interested in real estate. They had experience. I'm like, sure, let's do this. Let's make this happen. Um, I'm not much of a planner. If none of this talk has given you that impression. I am not much of a planner. Um, but then when COVID happens, you know, I live in Virginia and it shut down the world, obviously. But one of the things I didn't anticipate it shutting down was hard money lenders. And literally I had active investors mid deal, like they're getting ready to close in a couple days and the hard money lenders just shut their doors. Funds dried up. They, you know, commercial lines of credit that they had with banks, they were no longer lending. They were not doing anything. So it was suddenly this kind of like mad rush, everybody kind of coming out of the woodwork that I'd potentially worked with in the past saying, Hey, do you happen to have any capital again? Because, you know, they can't close this loan. Um, so we kind of like, we thought about it and we're like, Hey, we're going to be here a little while. Um, this is something that we've always wanted to explore. We have the opportunity. I'm home all day now because I didn't have an hour commute each way. Why don't we do this? Um, so we actually made it kind of an official business in the beginning of 2020 and we've been doing it ever since. Wow. That's great. So any bad deals? Um, I wouldn't necessarily say bad deals. Like I lost money. I had a couple deals, like I mentioned earlier, they just went longer than expected mostly due to just supply chain problems with COVID. Um, I haven't had any issue with investors as far as like they go, they go and put their head in the sand and they just completely ghost me and you know, don't give updates or anything like that. Um, because again, I'm viewing this as a relationship. I'm very straightforward with my expectations. Like we will have a weekly update. You will send me photos. You will have videos. I'll drive by the property. Like there's not really any surprises when it comes to me. I, you either like me or you hate me. Like, I'm going to be upfront with that. Um, so I'm, you know, knock on wood, I've, I've been very lucky that all my borrowers are, you know, good, responsible, experienced individuals. Um, and you have to bring a level of gratitude with you, I think, wherever you go. So I'm grateful for them to be in a partnership with them, not necessarily a legal partnership, but in this deal together. And they need to have some level of gratitude for me. And you know, I'm not saying like worship at each other's feet, but just like, hey, you know what? It's nice to work with you. It's nice to have these conversations with you. Hey, do you want to do another deal together? You know, after this one sells. Sure. You know, those types of conversations go a long way. 
So you build long-term relationships with them. You know, it's kind of yep. ongoing thing, one after another. And the yep. trust is there. You do not necessarily need anything more than that. Uh, yep. So let's uh, move on to our Q&A. And I wanted to remind everybody, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A box. And our social media friends, please put your questions in the comment and I will ask Alex. So the first question is from Jay Miller. She says, which position would you prefer a limited partner in a scaling real estate model, focus private performance based fund or the acquisition lender for an actual property or series of properties acquired by the fund for a specific exit? For that one, it's a little outside of my scope because it's more on the LP side. Um, and even when I'm doing LP investing, I, there's, I'm just going to break it out very simply. There's usually two types of uh, business models for LP investors to invest in. You're either going to have a high equity multiple, which a lot of development projects tend to be, or you're going to have something that's a little more stabilized and a little more cash flow. I'm personally a cash flow fan, so I want something that's going to have cash flow. So a lot of development projects, again, especially right now with supply chain problems, you know, they might, you might not get a distribution in a development project for two years. And I, I mean, I know that for a fact because one of my good friends is invested in a syndication that was developing um, retail space. They haven't got a distribution in two years because the property is not even finished yet. There's no rent coming in to do distributions with. Um, so I think that's more of a question for what are you hoping to get out of investing? You know, do you want that high equity multiple? Do you want a K-1? Do you want a 1099? You know, like what are you hoping to get out of real estate investing and then picking a model that gets you closer to that goal? Great. I think other question is from her as well. She says, sounds like you prefer acquisitions with existing structures as opposed to ground up developments. But I yes. think you did answer that during the presentation because she said second question answered during the presentation. Thanks also. First question is also answered. So disregard both. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jay. You're super cute. Okay. So next question is from Ken. I have single family rentals, personal loan that I would like to transition to my LLC. Two and a half years in between in business. Also would like to maintain close interest rate as my personal loans, would private lender or commercial real estate loans be the best route? If uh, commercial real estate is the best route, any recommendations on commercial real estate lenders? I will say private loans as a whole are usually going to be priced around the same level as hard money lenders. So it's going to be an annualized interest rate anywhere between 8 and 20%, depending on the state and the lien position. Um, there's going to be a couple, usually a couple origination points, either paid on the front or paid at the back. So it's going to be generally private loans are going to be a short term kind of stopgap measure, similar to what hard money lending is. Like I mentioned in the presentation, there are people that don't want that constant churn. They just, they want the money deployed for five years. They want to get those payments for five years and you might be able to negotiate a lower rate with that. But generally, you know, most private lenders, they're going to want to have some sort of reasonable return on their money. If you think about, you know, the latest Fed numbers are seven and a half percent of CPI index, you know, for inflation. And if you know how badly mangled the CPI number is, you realize it's probably a lot higher than seven and a half percent. So there's no incentive for us as private lenders to tie up our capital for five years earning 5%. Like we're just automatically losing money year after year if inflation's eating it um, at seven and a half percent a year um, or whatever they think is gonna be happening. Um, so just from that perspective, I'm gonna say an institutional lender, whether it's a commercial lender or doing something like conventional financing, though it's probably gonna be a better bet because that money is then taken back and securitized so they can then go out and re recapitalize and relend again. It's not going to be like a buy and hold this loan situation. I don't have any specific commercial lenders in mind. Um, I can say that usually investors, it's best if you go and start a relationship with a local community or regional bank. Um, if you have your deposit counts there for your rentals, for example, you can go and talk to them about a portfolio loan, something that they are going to keep on the books, that they are not going to turn around and sell on the secondary market. Oh, thank you. So our next question is, what would uh, what we uh, what we would expect ARR on private lending? What would you expect? Can you say that again? Yeah. What 
I think, yeah, what would you expect an ARR, annual uh, rate of return on private? Okay. Um, if you're not doing origination points, I would say the low side is probably 8% annualized. Um, if you're doing second lien, you could do 20 or 30% annualized. It really depends on your market. Uh, the thing about investment property, lending for investment property, is actually controlled on a state-by-state -state level, whereas owner-occupied property is controlled at the federal level. The lending, the licensing requirements, you know, the lending requirements, the upper limits for what you can charge, that's all federal for owner-occupied property. For non-owner-occupied property, investment property, that's in a different bucket, so it goes underneath different usury laws. So those are going to be um, a little more lenient on what they can charge. Um, some states, for example, don't have an upper limit for a usury. If I'm a business lending another business money, your, re your real estate ABC LLC, um, if the going rate is 20% for a first lien in that market, I can charge 20% because there's no usury limit for one business lending another business money. So it's kind of hard to say on average, um, you know, it's going to be this or it's going to be this. And also the markets are very different. The West Coast, for example, in California, you can get a hard money loan for six, seven, eight percent right now. Whereas if you are in New York or New Jersey, you probably are going to be pretty lucky if you're seeing anything under 12. You know, so it's just it's going to be very state specific market by market. And also, according to the lien position, um, how much you're lending against the value of the property, the LTV. So if you're lending at 30 percent LTV, that's probably going to be a lower interest rate because you're a lesser risk than somebody who's lending at 70% LTV. So let me ask you this question. If somebody wants to start uh, private lending or wanted to become a private lender, what do you require or how can they start? What is it required? Um, is there any licensing or anything <laughs> like that? Mm -hmm. uh, the, unfortunately, the licensing and the whole process of lending for non-owner occupied properties is very state specific. So in one state, it might require a license. In another state, they don't care and it's no license required. And again, that bucket, you have to pay attention to that bucket of I'm going to be one LLC lending money to another LLC for an investment is a very different conversation to, in some states to an, an, I'm an individual lending another individual money to buy a house. Those are two very different conversations, two very different uh, sets of lending laws that have to go into it. So again, that's gonna be something that's very state specific. For someone that's interested in trying to figure out what those requirements are, I can advocate, go find an attorney and I have lots of you know, referrals I can provide um, that is familiar with lending in the state you want to lend in. It doesn't necessarily have to be the state you are currently occupying. Um, a good friend of mine lives in California, but he's actually a private lender in Indiana. So he's, he's just familiar with that market. He likes that market. Uh, it's a lot lower, you know, so his $500,000, for example, you know, might go into one house potentially in California, but it goes into 10 houses in Indianapolis, you know, so he gets that little bit of diversification across multiple borrowers, multiple projects. Uh, but I would say, usually I would say a minimum to be a private lender, if you're going to be what's called a balance sheet lender, so you're lending out your own capital, it's probably about $50,000. There's still markets in the United States where you could be in a first lien position for $50,000. A lot of people start out private lending. Um, they'll lend their own capital and maybe they'll do one or two loans, but then they're out of capital. So they'll actually start brokering. So there'll be other people in their network that kind of see what they're doing and say, hey, you know, I'd love an extra $500,000 a month. You know, that, that pays both my car payment. Sure, I'll do that. And they can actually be the connector between an active investor and a potential private lender, a source of funds, and they can broker the loan. Again, very state specific on if you need a license to broker private, private money. So again, it's gonna fall back on the, what are the state lending laws for the state you want to lend in? Hmm, interesting. And that I think leads to this question now, because I heard that I'm not sure if it's true or no, but is it like a, a legal, like, people can pull in the funds like for a syndication and then they can do the private lending on that versus just brokering and uh, charging the brokerage fees? Yes, yeah, so you can absolutely make a 506B or a 506C, um, a Title III, a Reg A, whatever, whatever process you're using to pool capital. 
you could just get five friends together and decide you're going to open up lending ABC LLC and everybody puts a certain amount of capital into it and you agree on which loans to lend on. Um, so there's lots of different ways to pool capital together and form. Usually it's called a debt fund because you are then going to be issuing debt as opposed to taking an equity position in a property like a, like a uh, JV partnership or something like a syndication does. Interesting. Okay, let me remind everybody uh, that if you have any questions, please put it in the Q&A. And the social media friends, if you have any questions, please put it in the comment. So let me check uh, if we have any questions in the comment boxes in any of the social media portals. Give me one. Sure. Okay, I do not see any more questions. Yeah, I do not see any more questions. So uh, people on the Zoom call with us, if you have any questions for Alex, this is your chance. Uh, please ask now. So G is asking for a small group to start a debt fund. Tribe West could be a good place to start. Hmm, interesting. Wow, that's good. So Tribe West is going to be, uh, that's not going to be so much a debt fund. That one's going to be... Um, a partnership amongst people together. Um, and it sounds like it's a small distinction, but it's actually a huge distinction in the eyes of the SEC. So if you are coming together as five friends to do, to everybody brings $50,000, so you have $250,000 technically pooled together to then lend out, you are a business lending out capital. You are not pooling funds because if you, if you consider it pooling funds, that means you are taking money from passive investors. So all five of those people in your Tribe Vest LLC have to have technically some job, some active involvement. And you know, according to Tribe Vest, you know, just you know, voting on motions or checking into the portal itself can be considered active involvement. Um, so that's a very different conversation than creating what's considered a debt fund, because a debt fund involves you have to have uh, passive investors for a debt fund. Um, and those passive investors, you have to be, they're protected by the SEC, Securities and Exchange Commission. Um, and the way they are protected is the person that's offering that security is actually, uh, has to qualify for one of the exemptions. Uh, most investors are going to be very familiar with a 506 exemption. There's several of them. Like I mentioned, there's Title III, which is crowdfunding. Uh, there's Reg A, which is Regulation A plus series. Um, there's the 506, you know, whether it's B or C, there's another one, I think it's 521. There's a lot of different exemptions from the SEC. So at that point, you can then go and, you know, court passive investors to create a true debt fund. Okay. Thank you. Any more questions, please put in the Q&A. But at, um, Jay is asking or sharing something. They can start an investment vehicle on a mutually agreed upon theme. Other yep. than that. Okay, just like SPV kind of thing, right? Yeah, yeah. They, there's people, um, I've had Josh talk on my group uh, about Tribe Best, and I'm, I'm a big fan. And there's people that will pool their capital together and then invest in syndication. So the syndication minimum is, you know, 50000 And it might take someone a little while to get 50000 of their own, you know, dollars. Whereas if they just go and create kind of this investing club, if you want to think about it, where everybody puts in, if you have 10 people that put in $5,000, you can then basically get into a syndication for $5,000 instead of $50,000. So again, at that point, everybody's an active participant. Everybody's looking at deals. Everybody's voting yes or no on the deal. So you all have active participation. Great. So yes, the recordings will be shared with all. So Alex, can you share with us how people can reach out to you? Yeah, absolutely. So you can find me on LinkedIn. It's just Alex Brashears on LinkedIn. Uh, the group is called Lend to Live Private Lending Lessons. It's the little logo you see right here. Um, so feel free to look up on Facebook for the group. I'm in the, I'm in the group every day making uh, posts or conversation with people in the group. And then, like I mentioned, we have a book coming out. So if you're interested in getting some more deep dive information, um, there's lots of free information in the group. Uh, my group also has educational little events like this. It's like Binky. So we record our converse, our events and put them on our YouTube channel. There's lots of ways to get a lot of great uh, information 100% for free. Thanks, Alex. And if you'd like to reach out to me, I'm going to share my uh, contact information here. Please feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. I'm all over the social media. And also you can go to my website 
lumbainvest.com and download my ebook, Seven Reasons Why Syndication for Long Term Worlds. And thank you, uh, everybody, once again for joining. And I'll see you again in two weeks with an, another awesome guest. Thank you, Alex, once, once again. Bye. Thank you.